I want to invite you this morning to take out your teaching outlines as we are beginning a brand new message series that I'm very excited about titled Apron of Service. Now, how many of you have ever put on an apron before? Okay. How many of you are waiters or waitresses currently right now? Anybody? Okay. How many of you have been a waiter or waitress? Okay. I put myself through seminary doing that. I got a lot of good tips. The biggest tip I ever got one time was, it was a cheap bill too. It it may have been like a $15 bill, but this person happened to lead the, the university that I was going through to pursue one of my degrees, and I happened to wait on his table, and he left me like a $50 tip on like a really small, really small bill. And so we, we thank God when you have those tips like that. But a lot of serving that you do in life, uh, you don't necessarily get recognized for, but yet you're still called to wear the apron. And so I brought an apron up here that I wanted to, I'm not going to wear it the whole message because uh, this is one of my favorite shirts for the summer, so I don't want to rest it. Let me just put this on here. I don't want to ruin the hair. Okay, here it goes. All right. So, by the way, this one's a little dirty. Move that. That's not good. But I'm wearing this because I want to just tell you, if you have any aprons that I could borrow in a couple of weeks, I'm going to need it for an illustration, the different aprons of service. But there is a, a mindset that goes on when you put on an apron, whether at home you're cooking, whether you're taking and waiting on tables, whether you're in your wood shop, in your garage, and you're building something. There's something about putting on an apron that spurs a person into a work mentality, a service mentality of uh, delivering on what they need to do. And isn't it interesting that throughout the scriptures, God gives us this understanding of putting on the mindset of service. In fact, if I had to describe the apron of service, I would this way. It is putting on a mindset of service. See, God never intended serving others and serving in church as just a program, just a, an hour sheet that I fill. You know, through the years, and it's perfectly fine that uh, those in high school have to get requirements for service hours. I think that's a great thing, by the way, and all schools should mandate that. Uh, but as grown-ups, as teenagers, no matter who we are as children, we should never look at serving God and others as just fulfilling a requirement or just volunteering uh, just because I'm needed. It's much deeper than that. Serving is to be a mindset that we put on. And to illustrate that, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, which serves as the theme for this series, the theme verse for this series, it says this, all of you clothe yourselves with humility. Now circle the word clothe. You'll notice in the drop-down box in your notes, the Greek word gives us the understanding of tying an apron around oneself. So to clothe yourself, and then clothe yourselves with humility, and this particular Greek word for humility means attitude of service. So it's the understanding that the believer is to clothe themselves as if a server would put on an apron to get to work. And you think about You know, there's many different types of aprons, but most of them have pockets where you could put something, stuff in. And so it's this understanding that as a believer, you want to put on the attitude and mindset of service. It's not just something that you leave on the side. It's not just a facet of your Christianity. It is a main component of your Christianity. And if you want to grow spiritually, you want to model the mindset of service in your life. Now, this is a theme that's seen throughout Scripture. But one of the most beautiful pictures has to do with the priestly garments in the Old Testament. Notice this in Exodus chapter 28, verse 43. It says, These garments, referring to verse 42, must be worn by Aaron and his sons whenever they enter the tent of meeting or approach the altar to notice to minister in the sanctuary area so that they do not incur guilt or die. This is to be a permanent statue for Aaron and his sons and future descendants. There was this idea of putting on particular garments that God specifically designed. Now, as you begin to study the garments, everything from the ephod to uh, whether it be the breastplate, take, for example, the breastplate that they were to wear. It's interesting that many of those gemstones in that breastplate will be what you see on the gates in heaven. And so just a foreshadowing of what's to come. And so you think about these garments of putting them on because they had to have a certain type of reverence with serving God. And that's how we look at serving, is that I am putting this on, this attitude and mindset on, 
as somebody would put an apron on. That's how the Bible describes him. And then, of course, Jesus. Before he was betrayed, he washed the feet of the disciples. And in John 13, 35, it says, uh, 13, 5 rather, it says, then he poured out some water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and he dried them with the towel that was around his waist, which was his apron. And there's this understanding throughout Scripture of putting on the attitude and humility of service. And that is exactly how we need to think when it comes to serving God. That God wants us to think and believe this way. Now, how do we do that? You'll notice this here in your notes. Scripture teaches that service to God and others, notice this, is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's how we live. Whoever's in front of you, you want to look to serve. You want to serve, obviously, with how you treat people, your attitude. That's first and foremost. You serve with your awareness because there's needs all around you. You serve with your actions by being active with the talents and the gifts and the abilities that God has given to you. And you serve with your availability. We stop pushing it off and waiting until it fits into our schedule. In other words, God wants us to not treat service as just some program in the church or some humanitarian effort. He wants us to be thinking like a servant by putting on the mindset of a servant as if we were serving somebody food or serving somebody something that they needed. We want to put on this apron of service, put on this mindset of service. And so over these next couple of weeks together, we're going to look at the different aspects of this teaching, but in particular, the idea that serving is a lifestyle today. When you think about a lifestyle, lifestyle then means that people are making choices. If I'm choosing to live a healthy lifestyle and eat a certain way, well, I'm making choices to take care of my body physically and with my diet, with nutrition. Well, maybe I'm making a decision. I'm going to go into a lifestyle of, of becoming a police officer. Well, there are certain lifestyle choices I need to make. Even after I become a police officer and I go through the academy, there are certain creeds that I need to adhere to in my life, uh, whether I'm on duty or I'm not. I'm making a lifestyle choice. Okay, I'm going to become a teacher. Well, there's decisions that I need to make. There's choices that I'm going to make that are going to agree with that lifestyle. Okay, I'm going to bring a child into this world. I'm going to raise children. Well, there's choices that need to be made as now having a lifestyle of a parent. And so lifestyles require choices, and serving God requires choices. So no matter who you are, how young you are, how old you are, or somewhere in between, it's important that this is for everybody. All of us need to have a mindset of service. In fact, I think it's impossible to complete many of the commands as they relate to other people without this mindset. You know, it's impossible for me, no matter how young or old I am, to properly love my parents without putting on an attitude of service. You know, the Bible says that I'm to respect my parents. Well, whether I'm a teenager or I'm an adult, that doesn't go away. If I have a mindset of service, I could do that effectively. If I'm going to respect people in the church, if I'm going to serve people in the church, if I'm going to serve my neighbor, the list goes on and on. God has called us to have this mindset of service, so we want to put this apron on, and in doing so, we're making certain choices that pertain to our life. And so in order to illustrate this for you more clearly, I want to invite you this morning to turn with me to Mark chapter 10. And starting in verse 35 we get an incredible account of Jesus teaching his disciples about service. Now, this is prior to the cross. This is prior to all the events that would unfold, obviously, in Gethsemane. Um, and of course, this is a prelude to the ultimate service that Jesus would do on the cross. But it's here that he wants to instruct his faithful men about what service is, and also because Many of them had some misconstrued ideas, which we're going to see in this passage. And so let's read these opening four verses, starting in verse 35. It says this in Mark's account, which is also recorded for us in Matthew's Gospel. It says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want to ask you to do for us whatever we ask you. Now let's back up here. Who are James and John? They are brothers. And Jesus nicknamed them the sons of thunder, and rightfully so for their bold and young attitude. James and John, along with another set of brothers, Andrew and Peter, would become the inner circle of Jesus' ministry, and they would always be looked upon as leaders. In particular, Peter, James, and John, they witnessed the transfiguration um, of Jesus. 
they were also there for the healing of Jairus' daughter. They were looked upon as leaders, also in the events in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so these are two of the most uh, trusted leaders of Jesus. And it says they came to Jesus and they had what seems like a very immature request, kind of like a child does to a parent sometimes. They want them to promise them something before they give them the details of what they want them to promise them. You know, maybe your kids have done that to you, or maybe you've done that to your parents. Hey, I want you to, I want you to do this for me, but before you agree to it, um, I want you to agree to it first before I tell you about it. What? Well, that's what's happening here. We want you to do whatever we ask you to do for us, we want you to say yes to. And so that's a very childish request. We find out from Matthew's account that their mother actually made the request with them. Their mommy came to them. Now, we find out from studying Matthew's gospel very closely that they were playing the family card because these are actually Jesus' cousins. Their mother is the sister of the mother of the Lord. And so they approach Jesus and they, they're going to have a specific question for him. Verse 36, this is what we're told now. Um, and Jesus said to them, what do you want me to do for you? He asked them. Now, verse 37, they said to him, allow us to sit at your right and at your left in glory, in your glory. Now, this was a very familiar request that people would make, especially of their family, who they recognize as having some type of power. And it was, I want to be recognized in your kingdom that you're going to be setting up. Because still to this point, they haven't put it all together. They're thinking that indeed Christ has come to be a liberator and the yoke of the Roman Empire will be dispelled as well as the misguided teachings and oppression of the religious leaders, namely the Pharisees and so forth. And so they're thinking that his glory is going to be set up on earth immediately at some point and that they want to make sure that they have the best seats in the kingdom to the left and the right of the Lord. And so this is a very common request, but also a very selfish one. Now, verse 38, listen to Jesus' response. You don't know what you're asking for. Have you ever said those words? You don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Now, this is an Old Testament idiom, meaning that are you ready to fully experience all that I'm going to do? Or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. And think about what baptism symbolizes. You go under the water and you come up. It symbolizes death and ultimately resurrection. And so are you ready, in other words, to drink the cup of suffering that I'm going to go through? And are you ready to agonize to the point of your life being taken from you for the cause of following me? Are you ready for all of that? I think that's a, a very good question to ask. Now, Jesus is getting into this moment with them, and he's bringing this up to them because their egos are through the roof. We've told you before what ego stands for, edging God out. And that's what's happening here. They're worried about where their position is going to be. Their ego is getting in the way of their service. Their ego is getting in the way of what, they're, what they've been originally called to do. They've been called to be a servant. They haven't been called to play musical power chairs next to Jesus. Anyway, His kingdom was not going to unfold that way to begin with. And so their perspective is totally off, and it gives to us a biblical principle that emerges here that will help you and I live a lifestyle of service. And you might want to write this down. Choose to resist your ego. Everybody has an ego. Your ego shows itself in different ways. Now some people, they're very good at hiding their ego of wanting to get their way all the time. But they think a lot of crazy things in their head about other people and how things should go. And they have a lot of cross judgments going on. Then there are those who are just simply rude to people. They communicate rudely. They don't accept excitements well. And that is not living a lifestyle of service. What's happening there, and I think we've all experienced this, is the ego is taking over. The ego is telling us more than we want to tell. And usually our ego flatters us more than, than we should be getting anyway. And so if you're going to be an effective servant, you want to resist your ego. Because that's why Jesus is getting, he's helping them dial it back a few notches. Hey, you want to sit to the left and the right? Let me tell you about what my kingdom's about. My kingdom's about suffering. My kingdom is about sacrifice. That's what my kingdom's about. I don't know what you're focused on, but are you ready to do this? Are you ready to experience all of this? If you and I are going to be an effective servant to your spouse, to your children, to your parents, in church, to your classmates, to your friends, to your neighbors, 
We got to make sure that we are resisting our ego because our ego gets in the way all the time. You know, when your ego's not in check, what comes out of that eventually is we start judging people when your ego's not in check. When your ego's not in check, you start looking down upon people. When your ego's not in check, you start thinking they're a task that you're too good for. I've seen people think that way. Well, I'm too good to do this, and I'm too good to do that. We should never arrive at that place. If you ever arrive at that place, if you arrive at that place that you think you're too good for, to do certain things, to serve your family, to serve in the church, to pick this up or to do that, then guess what? Guess what's coming next? A fall right on your face. Pride cometh before the fall. We should be running to serve God in the menial tasks. We should be running to do the least work that, that, that somebody else may not want to do. Now, there might come a time when you're supervising and you're leading, and that's great, but we never arrive from that mindset of service. Now, it's interesting that James, who's a part of this group, would go on to be the very first martyr of the disciples. He was executed under Herod Agrippa I. We read about that in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. He would be the first disciple to be martyred for the faith. And John, uh, John lived a ripe old age, well into his 90s, and they tried to kill him many times. The fact of the matter is, is that this would all come to pass, what Jesus was saying. Now flipping over your notes, let's write this second principle down. Choose to refocus the purpose of your servant. Choose to refocus the purpose of your servant. We serve not to get credit. We serve not so other people look at us. That is not the lifestyle of service that God wants us to be living. Rather, God wants us to focus all serving for His glory. Listen to what Jesus says next in verse 40 of Mark chapter 10. After they said, we want to make sure that we're sitting on the left and the right, Jesus says this, but to sit at my right hand and at my left hand it's not of mine to grant. Now, he is acknowledging his view of God the Father's sovereignty. The incarnation of Christ represents that, and here we see it again. It's not for mine to grant, but it's for the Father. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. What we must realize is, is that many of the rewards in heaven are tied to sufferings here on earth. That's why in Romans chapter 8, it says very clearly, do not consider your present sufferings not worth comparing with the glory that awaits you in heaven. There are those, our brothers and sisters overseas, who are involved in ministries that would require their life if the enemy knew about it. That they are, their lives are on literally the chopping block. There are those who have literally lost their head for the cause of Christ. God is going to reward their faithfulness. He's going to reward their suffering. And that is what Jesus is bringing up here. He's saying, don't worry about this life. And to show you how important this is, guess whose names are written on the foundation stones of heaven? The apostles. There are 12 foundation. When you get to heaven, when you check in there, you'll see. There are 12 foundation stones in heaven. Heaven is ginormous as the new heavens are described. And each of those foundation stones, they're, they're a beauty, they're, they represent beautiful gemstones, the foundations, in addition to the 12 gates. And so here you have these incredible foundation stones that are each anchored by 1,500 mile high gates, pearl gates. And here you have these foundation stones, and in each of these stones is written one of the names of these apostles. And so they're thinking small when they're thinking we want to we want to we want a position here on earth. Forget about earth. Guess what's coming in heaven? That's a reminder for us here. Don't worry about getting a pat on the back here. You know, today we live in an age in church age the celebrity pastor. Pastors want to be celebrities. Everybody wants to be a celebrity. It's even made its way into the church now. It's not about being famous. It's about being faithful. And that is what Jesus is illustrating here. Don't worry about all this. Anyway, it's not for me to grant. The Father's going to grant that. And it's going to be based, it's going to be prepared on based on what you do here. See, a lot of people think, you know, you determine greatness here in life 
by how many people serve you. You know, a lot of these high-to-do people, they got a million people waiting on them. They got people, I, I read the other day, it was, it was the most ridiculous thing. Here's people, literally, as they're getting out of the car, there's somebody filing their nails, there's somebody making sure their shoes are buffed. I mean, it's ridiculous. I guess when you have millions upon millions of dollars, you run into things to buy, so you start buying people to, to do every little thing for you. Nevertheless, our focus should not be on getting. Our focus needs to be on giving. It's the polar opposite. Jesus said that it's more blessed to what? To give than it is to receive. You want to fix your marriage? You want to have a healthy and happy marriage? Look at it as, I'm going to serve the Lord by serving my spouse. That's a healthy marriage. You want to be a good son or daughter to your parents for as long as they're in your life, as long as they're alive? Look to serve your family. You want to be a good church member? Say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Here am I. Let me serve. That's the mind. Listen. That's the mindset of a servant according to Jesus. And if you should experience persecution here in the States, not to worry. The great scorekeeper in heaven is noticing. And he will reward accordingly. So whether you're here or you're on foreign soil, God has taken all of this into account. He wants you and I to refocus the attitude of our serving. He wants to remember what it is and why we do it. He doesn't want us to be people who look at opportunities to serve as interruptions to their life. Such was the case of the bank teller. Listen to this. A man dropped into a bank and found the customer service clerk chatting on the phone. On the phone, by the way. This is a good commercial in church to say, when church starts, silence your phones. It's always a good reminder to do that, okay? And so they, she was chatting on the phone about new restaurants in town. Not a bad thing to talk about, but you're at work. After three minutes of exchanging dark glances with each other, the man, the man, with the man, she said to her caller, this is the bank teller, hold on a minute, I'm being interrupted by a customer. Well, that's certainly not the mindset of an employee, and that's certainly not the mindset of a servant. But sometimes we look at people that way. Oh, hold on a minute, I'm being interrupted by God. Well, that's really what we're saying. You know what? When the, when, when the commercial comes. No, no. You know, I'll get off social media. No, no. Do it immediately. As God prompts you and He puts opportunities, do it immediately. Don't tell God to hold on. Don't say God is getting in the way. And sometimes we do that. Well, all of us have done that at one time or another. Uh, I, I would assume that many of our testimonies have something like that in there. I, I was putting, putting God on the back burner for a long time. God has called you and I to serve Him. He's called you and I to be active. He's called you and I to have the right attitude. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7 says this, serve with a good attitude. In fact, why don't we say this verse together, just so we're all mindful of it. Together. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people. We want to have the right attitude, whether we're in home or in the church. You know, some people will say things like this, you know, when I hit the lotto, then I'm going to... Well, stop it right there. You have a better chance of getting hit by lightning, first of all. Okay? Stop waiting to hit the lotto to serve God and give to God. Give of Him of who you are right now. Well, I'm waiting for it all to get together, and I'm waiting for this, and I'm waiting for that. It sounds a lot like excuse-making to me. God hasn't called you and I to make excuses. He's called you and I to serve Him. Oh, but I got this going on, and I got that going on. Well, remember, he does his best work. When we are at our weakest, he gives us strength. Remember that. His grace is made perfect in our weakness. And so you may not feel like it, but we're not called to walk by feelings. We're called to walk by faith. We're called to forgive. We're called to show mercy. We're called to show grace. All of this pertains to attitude. But don't miss the context of all of this. We're right before the cross. He's educating them spiritually on service. But there's something else that's going to be significant that comes out of this. Let's go to these next grouping of verses. Verse 41 down to 44. When the ten disciples heard this, they began to be indignant with James and John. Now some of you might be thinking, oh, they got upset because this request was ridiculous. Again, remember the request. Make us sit to the left and the right. But don't be fooled here. They're not upset because of the request. They're upset because they didn't do it first. How do we know that? Well, because an argument erupted between them, the disciples, at the Last Supper over who was going to be the greatest. 
This was a constant tug of war. Now, we could easily look back and go, oh, these disciples, but we, would, we do the same thing too. That's why we got to make certain choices. Now, verse 42, Jesus called them. He's going to put out a major fire of ego here. Jesus called them over and said to them, you know that those who are regarded as rulers and Gentiles lord it over them. So he's saying, you know the practice of our leadership style in our cultures. That those who have any type of power, well, they lord it over people. In other words, they, they're oppressive to people. And those in high positions act as tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Let's say that verse together, that first part. But it is not so among you. This is the Lord talking. This is not to be in the mind of a servant. Because then you can't be a servant that way. This is not to be in the mind of the believer. On the contrary, in other words, whoever wants to become great among you will be your what? Your servant. Circle the word servant. Dikenos in the Greek language. You know what that means? Check this out. It all connects, by the way. It means literally to wait on tables. Where to put, remember we said earlier, where to put on the apron of service. Why? Because the Lord put it on His waist. And the Lord has told His disciples and He's told every one of, every, each and every one of us that we got to put this understanding of service on. In other words, don't be caught up in who you're going to instruct and who you're going to lord your power over. Instead, you put on the mindset of a servant. You put on this attitude. Paul would go on to say, have the same attitude that is in Christ. Let it be in you as well. We're told to imitate Christ. This is all tying together for you and I as a believer. Whoever wants to be first among you will be your slave. Now, I personally believe that these grouping of verses are tied to what prompted in God's holy mind and heart the washing of feet with the disciples. This discussion, along with the argument over who was going to be the greatest, it's all tied together. And so Jesus chose to wash feet. The Son of God, the King of the world, washed stinky, dirty feet, including the one who would betray Him. Some of us, we get into a tiffy with a family member or a church member, and we want to exile them to Pluto somewhere. Okay, I've looked in for it, but nobody drives there, so I've tried to do it, but it doesn't work. Listen, the fact of the matter is, is that even when you're right and you've been wrong, God wants us to serve with our attitude. But a blanket understanding is, is that whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all means that I'm going to serve whoever is in my path. I'm especially going to, listen, the Bible says serve your leaders. I'm going to serve my leaders. If you sign a membership covenant, it says that I'm going to serve the church by being equipped by my pastors. It's actually, sometimes you may wonder, why do we paint schools? By the way, you know where this apron is from? I didn't steal this from uh, Perkins or something like that, okay? I just want you to know. This is an apron from the gift wrapping ministry. It's never too soon to start recruiting, by the way, and in four months we begin, okay? We start early in the end of November. Now, there's other things going on in the church. You might say, why does the church paint schools? Let the city do that. Well, we're showing God's love in a practical way to the teachers, the faculty, and especially those students. Why, uh, why do we have VBS next week? It's summer. We just want to prop our feet up. Or let the, you know, let the same people do everything. Let the, they just keep the church going. I just come and enjoy it. No, no. We want to put on the apron of service. This is my church. Just like in your home. This is my home. I'm going to take care of my home. This is our home. This is not my church alone. This is our church together. And it's not just the, the 11 o'clock service, it's, it's the other services that we have later on or any day of the week. It's our church and together we put on the apron of service. And so I encourage you, sign up to paint. Sign up to work in VBS. And in four months, sign up for gift wrapping. Sign up for different ministries in the church. Security. Children's ministry. You have gifts to teach. You have gifts to sing, to play instruments. Help out and keep the church up to date. There's lots of things that need to be done. Well, it takes a family to keep a family going. And so write this down. You may have been waiting to hit the lotto or get a title somewhere at a job for greatness. No, no, no. This is here. Jesus' seminary right here. 
Choose service as a pathway to greatness. Choose service as a pathway to greatness. God determines your greatness. I alluded to this earlier. Not by how many people serve you, but by how many people you serve. That's a paradigm shift, isn't it, in our culture? Your greatness in heaven will be determined by the suffering you experience for Christ and by how you served others. There you go. You're not going to get to heaven and you're going to get a special spot because you had a title in your profession or you have a degree on the wall. All of those things are wonderful if you've obtained them with integrity and thank God for the opportunity that you had. But that doesn't necessitate any blessing in heaven. Nor does the car that you buy or how many zeros you have in the bank account or if you just have one zero, whatever side you're on with that. The fact of the matter is, is that God has called you and I to choose service as a pathway to greatness. And so, the Lord says this then in Mark 10.45. For even the Son of Man. Listen to this. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. Now this keeps in line with the very humble beginnings of Jesus. You you think about a king being born. A king is not going to be born in a dirty cave somewhere. In an alley somewhere. Not going to happen. He's certainly uh, not going to live in poverty as he did. The Bible says the Son of Man had no place to lay his, his head. And so his entire life was one that is congruent with this statement. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And read this last part with me. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Now that word ransom is very important to the context of this study. The word ransom in the Greek language has ties to the understanding of making a sacrifice. Christ gave Himself as a sacrifice for you and I. In other words, He traded places with you and I. We should be the ones on the cross. But if there's a ransom for something, something has to be given. If a child is kidnapped, maybe you've seen movies like that, there's a ransom. If we're looking for information to, uh, for information to lead to a crime, there's a ransom that's promised. A ransom had to be given to ultimately satisfy the wrath of God the Father. That cup of suffering is the wrath that should be upon all of us, but Christ, He took our place. He was our ransom. He was our sacrifice. And so, you and I need to view serving that way. Serving is not, oh, I got a cross to bear. I got to take care of this one or do that. Don't look at it that way. That family member that you're called to take care of, that is your ministry. That's your seminary. That's a, that is of the utmost honor to take care of people. You don't need a title for that to be sacrificial that way. To care in the church, to serve in the church, to use your time, your talents, your abilities to serve God. It's all worthy. It's all important. And so, write this last principle down. Choose sacrifice as your ultimate expression of faith. Now, I worded it this way because there are lots of people, they have lots of expressions of their faith, right? People think you got to be loud and proud. That's how you show you belong to Christ we got to let everybody know that we belong to Jesus. I saw that, again, just recently in the city. You know, people with the megaphones, you're going to hell. I don't know if that's the best strategy for people <laughs> going to hell. Maybe just put up a sign that says you need prayer. Okay, let's just do that. You'll probably get a lot of takers. Because there's lots of hurting people walking around. Years ago when I was uh, going to work in the city, I'll never forget there was this guy, and he was, it, was, it had to be six... 15 in the morning or whatever. It was early. They quit the 6 o'clock boat. And there was this guy walking around. And, and again, if that's what somebody does, I'm not disrespecting them by saying don't do it, but I don't know how effective it is. But he's yelling at the top of his lungs with amplified sound, which you need a permit for, by the way, with a little walk-around amplified sound karaoke machine telling people how lousy they are and how they needed God. Now, in my years of practice with counseling people, uh, pastoral counseling, that is, I've really never had any trouble having to convince people how lousy they are. I think we all know how rotten we are. We don't admit it to everybody because that's pride. Deep down inside, I've never met somebody who was so prideful that they didn't think 
that they were rotten deep down inside. When you get down to it, that's that conviction of a holy God. They don't even realize they could be the biggest atheist on the block. But that's that conviction. There is a good, there is an evil. And so, we don't need to go around masking raid how great we are. That should not be the expression of our faith. Because I watch people doing this. I watch people yelling. I watch people getting up. They didn't want to hear it. But I personally have had many conversations in my years, whether it be on the ferry or anywhere else about the Lord, very peaceably and calmly. And many of them went very well, by the way. God isn't calling us. It's not about how loud we can be. It's also not about, let me play the martyr. I, can't, I can never buy a new shirt. I can never put gel in my hair. i got to look disheveled. i got to fast all year round. God doesn't want me to be happy. If I even look happy, He might hit me with lightning. Where does it say that? Some people act that way. Can't do this, and don't say Merry Christmas, and don't do this, and don't do that. That's lunacy. And if you get sick, don't take medicine because then you got no faith. I mean, there's lots of crazy things out there. Oh, and this one they is sick. They must not be a strong Christian. And this one died. They, oh, they didn't believe in Jesus. And that's what comes out of that mindset. Those expressions of faith are dangerous to the overall witness of Christ. Let me tell you what's the greatest expression of faith. Sacrifice. Because the greatest expression of love was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. While you have not been called to sacrifice for your own sins, you've been called to reflect the One who has sacrificed for your sins. God is, wants you to spend the rest of your life living with that mindset. William Carey, who is considered the father of modern missions, he served the Lord in India for many years. He gradually became very concerned about the attitude of his son Felix. The young man had promised and pledged to become a missionary, but he reneged on his vows when he was appointed ambassador of Burma by the Queen of England. Carey wrote to his friends asking for prayer for his son with these words, pray for Felix. He has degenerated into an ambassador of the British government when he should be serving the king of kings. Now, obviously, listen, as God has blessed you in, in a job to work your job, the point is, is that represent Christ on that job. Be sacrificial at that job. Be sacrificial at your school. Be sacrificial in your home. And for crying out loud, be sacrificial with the things of God. Now, I'll share this with you. You will never, ever regret being God's servant. Because God is a loving master. But I'm going to tell you right now, we can line up from here all the way to California with all of the regrets we have by playing the slave to sin. Because sin is a cruel master. Stop sacrificing all that God has for you for temporary, cheap fulfillments of pleasure. They might look good right now, but it's building up regret after regret after regret. Christ ransomed. Christ took your place on the cross so that you could put on the apron of service. And this apron is to be worn with honor. This apron is to be worn with integrity. This apron is to be worn until you go home to heaven and you hear those words. You don't hear well done, good and faithful. Good, well done and faithful entertainer. Good, well done and fader, faithful athlete. Good and faithful men, millionaire. No. Well done, good and faithful what? Servant. And wouldn't you know, that word as well speaks of the apron of service. Well done, good and faithful wearer of the apron of service. That is what God has called us to do. And so I encourage you, as your pastor, as someone who loves you and who cares for you, that your maturity in Christ, your growth in the Lord, is tied to serving Him. And so, if you want to get more involved and serve the Lord, on your connection card later on in the service, go ahead and just jot that down. Come and speak to one of us personally. You want to paint? That's a great way to get involved. You want to serve in other summer ministries? Let us know. The door is wide open. You know, this church was built on serving. Before we ever had a service, we were at Rescue 5 cooking after September 11th, the events of September 11, 2001. 
Long before we even had our monthly meetings, we were serving. This church has always had a presence in the community. And the day it doesn't, take down the sign of church and put up club for me, okay? I can tell you, as long as I draw breath, and as long as you'll have me here, we will continue to be the church that God has called us to be, and that is a church that puts on the apron of service. And that is what is expected of us for such a time as this, that we would have a mindset of service, that we wouldn't tell God to wait, we wouldn't let God think where He's, being in, he's interrupting our plans. We want to remember that we, His plans need to be our plans. And His plans is that each and every one of us would be people of service, because that is the mindset that God wants His people to put on. Christ served you and I by being a sacrifice on the cross. He didn't remain dead, and the third day He rose from the dead. We're told in Ephesians that God has prepared good works for us long before we even knew Him. But He's prepared these good works that we might walk in them. And so my encouragement to you is don't be distracted by the many voices that are out there, including the devil himself through his minions who want to tell you X, Y, and Z of why God can't use you and why God doesn't want you. Don't let that stop you. You remember that Jesus Christ has saved you to serve. And He has prepared good works for you to walk in. And He's done so by calling you to put on the mindset of serving. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Bow with me for a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank You, O God, for this mindset of service that You've called us to have. For it is the mindset of You, the mindset of Your Son. The mindset that honors and glorifies, not grieves the Holy Spirit. I pray, O God, no matter who we are, if we have advanced in years, that we would say, Lord, the rest of my years, even though they might be short, I want to lay them all out for You. Lord, for those who are tweens and teenagers that are here or listening at home, Lord, I pray that they would see the value, the importance of being committed to You at an early age in their life and how very strong that they could be. They could be the next leaders of the church. Lord, I pray for those of us in between, O oh God, that we would not waste time, O oh God. We would not let the busyness of the, the normal day-to-day -day get in the way of the responsibilities that You've called us to serve the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And so we thank You for the high calling, the privilege to be Your servants. We commit this prayer before You in reverence because Your Son Jesus Christ took our place on the cross. He rose from the dead, reminding all of us, O oh God, that in heaven we will be remembered and honored there. But while we're here, we want to keep our hands to the plow with our apron on tight, serving You until You call us home. And so God, I pray for each one of my brothers and sisters here today that we would walk in the reality of this attitude and mindset of service. We commit this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.